Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the SIG architecture introduction and update. Uh, you might be wondering what SIG architecture is and what its role in the Kubernetes community is and what we've been doing for the past time and what's new coming. Probably we'll talk, up, if we get some time, we'll talk about those things too. So um, I am Dims. My nickname is Dims, so you can call me Dims. Uh, on Twitter, GitHub, and uh, Slack, CNCF Slack, Kubernetes Slack, I'm easy to find, D-I-M-S. So hit me up if you have a follow-up later uh, or if you want to get engaged in the community. Happy to get you all on board. John? I'm John, yep. I'm John Balmeric, and uh, I am also John Balmeric everywhere. So um, easy to find if you can remember my name. And uh, so, yeah, happy to, to chat with any of you anytime. Uh, if you came to this talk, you have John's name. <laughs> <laughs> Just look up the sked. That's right. Yeah. All right, let's get started. Okay, so let me go over there so it's a little bit easier than. You, you can like switch. So the goals of the Kubernetes project, um, is anybody not using Kubernetes right now? Right? So all of you are using Kubernetes, and you kind of like agree with the st statements that we have made there. Um, those were the goals that we written down uh, in our documents saying, these are the things that we would like to see. Uh, this kind of helps us going forward to um, it's not just the state of the art thing that we're talking about right now, but we're also, when we design new features, when we think about things that we need to do and uh, how to do it, uh, these are the goals that literally helps us figure out like, okay, for example, number three, right? Like, if, is there, if when we are designing something, hey, this is just too much for users, uh, it's too complicated, uh, we need to simplify, can we like go halfway to make it simpler for the users, even if it is harder for us to do it on the back end kind of thing? So we use this as a mechanism to say, okay, fine, you're writing a new enhancement proposal, please take a look at these goals uh, as we do the design. Go ahead. Uh, so we do have some values. These values are very important to us and you will see these reflected when you come talk to us, when you come and talk to us uh, on Slack or mailing list or uh, PR reviews. Uh, this is what we believe in. And uh, anybody disagree with any of these things? Probably not, right? So uh, this has kept us very good. Uh, in fact, let me take one thing and poke on it, right? Like, for example, automation over process. So if you go look at how our testing infrastructure is set up, right? Uh, you know, it's running on really good with a few bumps here and there, but it's mostly things are happening on its own. We write bots, and bots talk to each other. Bots talk to people. So uh, that is one example of how we are doing number three. Okay? Uh, next one. So the... Uh, Kubernetes um, is part of CNCF. So overall structure is CNC, um, well, if you want to start right at the top uh, for technicality, there is Linux Foundation and there is CNCF. And within CNCF, um, you have the CNCF uh, TOC. And uh, CNCF TOC has a bunch of tags, technical advisory groups. And tag runtime is probably what we come under. Um, and under TOC is all the projects. Um, Kubernetes is one uh, of the projects. And in fact, the CNCF uh, Foundation was started with Kubernetes as the first project. So within Kubernetes, we have a whole bunch of special interest groups. Um, some of them go deep. Some of them go horizontal. Uh, I'll take some examples here, like take SIG Windows. They focus on how to run uh, Windows-based workloads on Kubernetes better. And another example, if you take SIG release, um, you can see that that SIG owns the release process and it coordinates amongst all the SIGs. It fixes out the calendar date when we need to make a ship and then we work backwards to figure out like, 
when there's a feature freeze, code freeze, and things like that, so that we can actually have a release uh, together, right? And we end up defining policies uh, in the SIG saying, hey, um, we're going to do three releases a year via calendar-based, for example, right? So those are the kind of things that we do in a specific SIG that is horizontal. Testing is the same way. So it spans across all the SIGs that we work on. So um, that's the way. And we do have some special committees for code of conduct, security response, uh, and steering overseas the whole thing. Uh, in fact, uh, the way to think about it is when somebody comes to us to do some work, we look if it fits in any of these buckets. And if it's not, we'll ask them to write a charter. And that charter essentially says, we own code repositories. Uh, we, this SIG will own code repositories uh, that pertain to whatever it is, X, Y, Z, right? Like something new you want to bring into the community. So then the steering essentially will approve the charter, and you begin your work. That gives you the validity uh, in the community to go around asking for resources and talking to people, and there is a technical lead, and there is chairs, and then you start doing your work, and you figure out how you want to do your work. Uh, and we also have, like if you take SigNode, for example, right? Uh, you talk about how, how the kubelet works. Storage uh, is similarly. What are the, uh, how, how does CSI fit into the picture, for example, right? So, um, so essentially, committees, SIG groups, working groups, and user groups. We are trying to get rid of the user groups, uh, and we are trying to push that out into um, the CNCF layer, so to say. So, and this is constantly evolving. We added new things. We took some old things out that were not really relevant, or there was no work being done. For example, there was a service catalog, six service catalog, and they were not doing anything. We you know, bumped them out. There are other things which span multiple six. We call them work working groups. Working groups, people from multiple six collaborate, and uh, the owning six will pay attention to what they want to do and how they do it. John, any? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the main points with this is that distribution um, is, is better than centralization. and so each of these groups will own a part of the code. The project level things tend to set policies and processes across the project. So architecture fits within that area. We don't actually own much, if any. We have maybe have a little bit of tooling code, but no real code and, um, or functional code. And so um, you know, that, that's, that's kind of where we fit in this. The horizontal pieces are things that every you know, the API server, the API machinery, and then the vertical are like resource management type of things. Um, so that, that's kind of how, how the project is, is organized. Um, so specifically talking about SIG architecture, um, our scope falls into, uh, like I said, kind of this cross-project um, cross area um, where we, we, we're sort of the, the, uh, the monks who keep the design principles uh, kind of uh, in... in in line and we have groups and processes that will help other SIGs as they're coming to design a, uh, a given feature, make sure that they're in line with those design principles and make sure that we're following all the different, um, uh, keeping Kubernetes, the Kubernetes that you know. Space? Space or tab? Oh, arrow key? Arrow key. Next. I don't know. Okay. Okay. Um, so like I said, the processes, different cost credit, uh, cross cutting processes around conformance, API review, and then each of those um, processes, we can go to the next slide, um, is, is sort of, oh, well, I guess that's, that comes later. Okay. Um, we can still go to the next slide. So, so we'll talk about each of these later in a bit. Um, other kind of issues tend to come up for us. So whenever there's a sort of question between SIGs about how something should be done, what, would, what makes the most sense within the context of Kubernetes as a whole, they typically will bring that, that sort of um, thing to us. We're not really an escalation path, but um, a lot of the people that participate in the SIG tend to be people that have been um, with Kubernetes for a very long time and have very deep and broad knowledge. Um, and so when there's a conflict between, say, the two chairs in a given SIG or the TL, you know, a couple of TLs in a given SIG and they're trying to figure out how to make it done, we're not going to make a decision for them, but we'll have a conversation with them and try to negotiate or 
or um, broker. Broker, that's a good word. Yeah, try and broker um, and sort of come back to those values, come back to those principles and say, okay, if we go back to those principles, if we go back to those values, let's think about each of these viewpoints in that context. So like other SIGs, SIG architecture is arranged into subprojects. So subprojects then have owners, those are the people kind of responsible for that area. So we talked a little bit earlier, or we saw a list of the different processes. Each of those processes is effectively run by one of these subprojects. Um, we have five subprojects in SIG architecture, and we're actually going to drill into each one. So, uh, um, do you want okay. to make Yeah, sure. So, the, uh, how many of you used CRDs, for example? Right? So, CRDs have to go through an, you know, CRDs and other things like all resources have to go through an API review, right? So, and the API review essentially says, okay, if you're, if you're adding a field or removing a field or you're converting from, the classic example we have is like, uh, typically, uh, you know, a re resource originally when defined was a field, say an IP address, which was a string, right? And then you figure out like, oh, there needs to be many IP addresses. So you turn that string into an array. We've done this before, but there is a set of rules and regulations because we have to think about version skews, um, how to support mixed versions of uh, things, the API servers and the kubelets. We have to figure out if older kubectls can work with the newer API servers and so on and so forth. So through, in, through time, we have accumulated a bunch of uh, thinking around how we can make it easier because uh, say somebody from six storage comes with an idea and we say, oh, we've done something similar before, but here were the pros and the cons and the problems. So maybe you should think about doing it the other way where we had lesser problems for end users, for example, right? So that is what the API review is. And we have a project board and we actually do, uh, written down the changes and the conventions and things like that. So when any of the six come to us uh, for API review, we point to them to these two documentations so that they can go read what it says and then come back to us and say, hey, uh, we looked at these things. Uh, some of those make sense, but we still want this unique thing that we want to do here. Uh, is it okay? And then we end up negotiating with them, talking to them, and like coaching them through the situation uh, so that it's good for the users, it you, it's good for the community, and it's use, u useful for the developers. Uh, next one. Yeah, well, if I can just yeah, say a yeah. couple of things about this. So API review is, is sort of one of the most critical aspects in the development process. And, and in, in the entry APIs, the built-in APIs, everything must go through, code re uh, through API review. And, um, you know, in a sort of, uh, if you're looking to participate in the project and you really want to get deep into lots of different areas, or even if you're in a, want to participate in, say, SIG node, working towards uh, being an API reviewer is a, is a great way to, um, to get involved. We really need more people to do that because it, becomes, it can become a bottleneck. We have many reviewers for API, but there's only a handful of people that can do the approvals. So it, it, it requires a sort of uh, a lot of knowledge in, uh, you need to do a lot of API reviews under the guidance of those few current API approvers before you know, you're sort of like, okay, you're good to go. Yeah. Uh, We've that. scraped our knees and bruised our, uh, <laughs> exactly. so many times. So uh, yeah. that's why we, we have this review. So to make it easier uh, for people who are doing the work. So reduce the burden on them and give them well-defined uh, rules that they can follow. Exactly. Yeah. And, and for CRDs, if you want to use the Kubernetes dot, you know, you want to use a kubectl.io group, then you need to go through API review as well. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So code organization is a massive, massive effort. Um, so everybody comes to us with a feature and they say, hey, this is a new feature here. This is what we want to do. This is going to be awesome. Everybody's going to love it. And we vendor the code into the tree and it pulls in things from GitHub here and there. And guess what? After six months, those people are gone, right? Uh, because they're off doing other things and it there is a set of people who have to maintain the dependencies, update to relevant versions, and make sure that you know, things are not broken. And there is this constant thing about, hey, uh, there is a 
CV that was in this dependency and you're using this dependency, my scanner is screaming at me, can you go pl please fix it, for example, right? So there's plenty of code maintenance things that we need to do. Another example is, uh, hey, um, we need to switch Go versions. Uh, we need to go to 118. And uh, uh, in 118, can we use uh, all the new fancy things that is coming in 118? Somebody has to say, hey, don't do it right now. Let us ship 124. When we go to 125, you know, then we can start adding generics a little bit, right? And then we'll figure out how it works, and then we'll expand the usage of generics somewhere else. So maybe we should start it with libraries first, because then those are easier, smaller to tackle. And you know, we'll figure out how we do the testing. Maybe uh, there's some additional problems that we'll end up seeing with generics. Uh, one simple example is, hey, uh, we need to patch something in master, and we need to backport to 124. And 124 doesn't do generics, right? Yeah. So those kinds of issues, uh, people come to us, and we work through those situations with them. And there is a constant effort to uh, make sure that the dependencies are up to date, they work, and the people who are ending up importing Kubernetes code into their repositories, they should feel that you know, we're not pulling the rug under their feet either, right? Um, so how many of you have uh, projects where you, uh, in your Go, uh, Go mod files, you import things from Kubernetes? Yes? So you are our audience, right? Like if we change stuff that is going to break you, come yell at us. Uh, if the tags that you want is not in the Kubernetes repositories, come and tell us. We'll help you fix those things. Uh, this is yours. You want to do? Um, sure, I can do that okay. either way. Yeah. Um, so the other uh, one of the other the other sub projects within um, Sig architecture and um, came out of well Sig PM closed down and so we adopted the enhancements process. So the enhancements process for those of you, how many of you have contributed to Kubernetes? A few of you, right? So if you want to bring a new feature to Kubernetes. Um, you know, you, you, you don't just start writing it. We want to have some agreement amongst the community that the feature is, you know, appropriate for Kubernetes, that the feature is um, designed properly in alignment with the other features so people know how to use it without having to, you know, read too much documentation. Um, and, and that it's, it's, you know, among other things. And so we have this process called Kubernetes Enhancement or CAP process. This is probably the thing that contributors interact with the most that comes out of SIG architecture and they hate us for the most. Because <laughs> um, it is a little painful, right? It's, but it's, it's like writing a design document. You gotta write a design document and there's a bunch of um, pieces of information you have to kind of uh, uh, fill in. And you have to walk that through a bunch of approvals and gates. So yeah. we own that process. There's a sub, sub project of trying to make that better. So if you're one of those few people that raised your hand and you contribute and you don't like how the CAP process works, come talk to us at that sub project come help us make it better. You know, um, some of us go through that process, some of us don't, and so feedback is what makes it better. Yeah, this was supposed to be my slide, but even if you wake up in the middle of the night, either one of us can talk yeah. to either of the slides, so. <laughs> yes, good point. <laughs> yeah. um, another sub-project, conformance. So if you, um, if you look at different Kubernetes distributions like GKE or um, Kenzu or some of these other ones, right, everyone will have a, certified Kubernetes badge. And if they don't, they can't call it Kubernetes. So that's a program run by the CNCF that, that uh, allows vendors to submit their, their uh, test results, and then CNCF gives them the badge or not. However, it's this group that decides what those tests are, which tests actually define Kubernetes, which functions are part of Kubernetes, and which are optional functions within Kubernetes. Uh, and so, sort of where, where does the name, name, when do you get the rights to use that name, which test do you have to pass? So um, we've been working on this for years and um, we had a whole bunch of technical debt. Uh, there's a team from a, a, a company in New Zealand called II that's really done a tremendous amount of work um, for the CNCF to kind of yeah. pay down that debt. And this is not just to bug the vendors to pass this test to it. It is to make sure that you all can depend on the, the out, uh, output to the project, uh, managed cloud providers. Uh, you get a consistent experience across all the products that you use, 
that say that they support Kubernetes, and that is the reason we do it. So it's exactly. not for us, it's for you. Absolutely, yes. All right, uh, production readiness review. So this is one of those things that people don't like, well, contributors don't necessarily love, um, but it's important. So two years ago, maybe, um, you know, as the project matured, uh, and there's, there's, you know, thousands and thousands of people depending on it to be stable, we, uh, we introduced a process that a lot of, you know, big tech companies use internally, which is for production readiness review. So essentially it's contributors, when they write those caps, we added a big questionnaire in there that as they move from alpha to beta to GA, they have to um, sort of document um, how you turn the feature on and off, um, the, how, what the metrics are for the feature, what are the known failure modes and how do you detect them. Um, basically, make it observable, make it supportable, um, and uh, ensure that the people who take this next version of Kubernetes that has this feature um, don't have to roll back. I mean, that's the main goal, right? We don't want people to have to roll back their Kubernetes. And, and again, this is for you, not for us, because we are, we are putting ourselves in your shoes and we are tell, asking the question, hey, uh, we turned on this feature, what metrics can I go look for that is new in this feature, for example, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. How do I know the feature is working? Yeah. Like, how, and how do I know if people are using it in my cluster? If I'm a cluster administrator, how do I know my application developers that are using my cluster are using this feature? Um, and you see the big QR code. So every year we do a survey, since we started, this is I think our third survey, um, we do a survey to, to see if it's effective, right? Because this is a burden on our, on our engineers and in the community. We wanna make sure that we're not wasting their time. So those of you that operate clusters, just please click on the link. Click on the link. Go fill it out. Um, it just asks some questions about, have you had to roll back? How many clusters do you have? How many nodes do you have? Um, do you think Kubernetes is more reliable than it used to be? So yeah. please, please go and do that. We, it closes at the end of the month, so just do it today. Yeah, um, so if, if you go look at the CNCF landscape, uh, I know it is a huge and big, and how, how did we get to that spot, right? That is because we were thinking about these things uh, we were saying, okay, we need to distribute responsibilities. So there is CSI, CRI, CNI. There's like, you name it, we have an extension point, we have webhooks, we have mutating webhooks, validating webhooks. We have all kinds of things where people can integrate. It was not the way at the beginning. Like if you go look at, uh, you know, five years ago, Kubernetes versions and uh, check those things out, you won't see it that way, right? Like, because everything was in a mono repo, everything, any vendor wanted to get anything in, everything was going right into the same bucket. But over a period of time, we, we did all these things so that people can do things outside of us without asking our permission, without needing to put things in our repository, for example, right? So, and again, so it's exploded the ecosystem. Like, there are literally, hundreds of projects out there that extend Kubernetes in one way or another, and that's a conscious decision. There are some bad outcomes to it. For example, the people who used to work on the core now go do something else, right? Like, so we need to figure out like, how to attract them back too. And that is happening too, because there is a plenty of times where what, what we have done is we've done an extension, for example, scheduling, right? So a scheduler is extremely um, you know, configurable. So people went experimented outside and now they're coming back and say, hey, we did this uh, experiments in like five projects. We are trying to do different things. Now we think that we are at a point where there are some things we need to add to Kubernetes code. Then we can go around changing everybody else and change the usage of Kubernetes. Again, the examples, I was already mentioning that, uh, you know. <laughs> One example is a funny example, CRD was an iterative thing. It wasn't CRD before, it was called a TPR, third party resource. That was one more experiment that we ran where we figured out, okay, uh, we defined some resources and we were trying to figure out how people use it and then we said, incorporating all those feedback, then we designed the CRD, then all of you are using CRDs. So, uh, so go ahead. Sure, um, so, where are we going? Where's the, sort of the overall project architecture going? And, and a couple of years ago, we did this talk and, and, and it was like, well, maybe it was at the Contributor Summit to talk about 
are you ready for V2 of Kubernetes? <laughs> and, and we said, no, and neither are we, and we're not going to do it. And the reason we're not going to do it is because the, instead, we're focused on building extension points. And by building extension points, we don't need to change, we don't need to go to a V2, which, of course, if you're familiar with semantic versioning, a V2 means we break backward compatibility. Yeah. We don't want to do that. So we can continue, we're going to continue on that. There's a, a real effort around things like CRDs, and this would be an API machinery say owns that, but um, to uh, make them as fully functional as the built-in APIs. Um, we're working towards it, it takes a long time. So, um, how can you participate? We do this, we have mailing lists, we have Slack channels. All we need you to do is come help us. So the things that we are going through, for example, the KEP enhancement proposal, if you are interested in a feature that is gonna come out in 125, we need your feedback. If you don't come and tell us how that is gonna affect you and whether it is gonna work for you or not work for you, you will only see it when 125 comes out and by that time it's too late. And then you need to wait till 126. So come talk to us. Uh, like I said, we don't buy. So speak up, offer your thoughts, uh, help wherever you can. Um, and typically what we say is uh, come to the closest to what you're already doing. Um, so for example, if you are interested in new features for your products, then uh, come to the enhancement process. If you are a maintainer who loves maintaining libraries and things like that, you know, come help in code organization, for example, right? So there is a lot of work to do, too few hands, and we would like your help. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. I have a question about GA. So, so as I understood, you folks actually like in charge of uh, letting the feature happen in the first place, but then there's a life cycle and then fe yep. feature reaches GA. Yep. I've heard an opinion recently that if it features, like if it reaches GA, it's there forever. And since then it will not ever move from the It's not true. Docker shim, gone. It's, Docker shim is one example. Can you give it? Like, oh, there's, there's lots of examples. Uh, we are removing the, um, PSPs too. Uh, so we've defined a life cycle for the PSPs to go out and it'll be replaced with something else, for example. All right. Yeah. So this, uh, it gives us hope that at some point ingress resource will go away and, uh, and will be superseded with a... It, yeah, it is gateway API. What? Gateway API is yes. a new thing. We um, want you all to switch to the gateway API. That's being defined okay. and people are working hard on it and that's what we're going to go to. So, so deprecation policies are, are sort of, yes, yes. part of our, our purview. But we, we do really want to make, you know, in an ideal world, once, a, once an API, specifically APIs, once they hit a GAV1, like, you, you don't want them to go away because people have built things on top of them. And, and when you take something away, now that person, that, that whole ecosystem built on top of that is either locked out or they are forced into a migration process. So we do take it very, very Long time to do it, but yeah. we do it, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've also said, uh, we have ex escape clause too in our documentation that says, hey, we reserve the right to do this yes. to make things better, so yes. Um, if I may, one more, but a bit change of topic. Yeah. Closer to the beginning of the talk, um, you mentioned like there was a list of values and you said that it helps you navigate, like if there's an like an event of uncertainty or like some conflict. Yep. You take the list of values and it yes. helps you come in, come in, and it helps you. Like, I'll give you the exact an example again with the, with the PSPs. We uh, the people in the SIG said, "Hey, uh, uh, um, SIG auth." They said, "Hey, this is not working. Let's just get rid of it. Let people use OPA, Kiverno, and other uh, ecosystem projects to do exactly the same thing." And people can already do that. So when all those things are there, why do we need to do it? That was the initial balloon that was floated from SIGOT. Then SIG security came to us and said, came to SIGOT and said, not cool. <laughs> we, we need something basic which will cover 80% of the cases. And then maybe the 20% of the cases, the advanced cases, we can use other things. So that was a negotiation and that was because we raised a cap and there was follow-ups and then we had meetings and we figured out like where 
we again goes back to meet the users halfway as a value. We said and that is exactly where it kicks in. This is where my question is yeah. like, do you among those values like are all of them are equal or some are more equal than the others? Like, or is there a priority? <laughs> say, like, when, uh, uh, in the event of like, like so uh, I think it's a so more human process than that. Uh, so I, I do want to say one thing there, which is. Uh, people in the room make the decision, right? Those are guidelines for the people in the room because the same people is, are not going to be in the room all the time, right? So those are guidelines for the people in the room to say, hey, please think about these things when you are making a decision, right? Yes, and it might the order of the priority of things might depend on the people in the room, but it's a general guideline. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Come on, there has to be one at least. Mohammed. Uh, I have a simple question, right? So Kubernetes v2, um, I'm told that's not a thing, but how do you align that with entire removal of v1 APIs, for example? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. There's no Kubernetes version 2.0 yeah. in the works. Again, so <laughs> we have a place where we like write down some things. Uh, hey, when we get a view on API, maybe we'll do that kind of thing. But there is no proposal on the table for a v2 v2 API, and there is no way v v1 right. API is going away ever. Well, well, let, let's say that a little differently. Yeah. Each API can evolve yeah. in its own time, right? Yes. And so. Every, every API group will have its ver your, your, your group version kind. Your, yeah. you know, so your group version, you get a V2. We have some V2s. We have a lot of scaling as V2. We have a few V2s. But what we're talking about is Kubernetes V2, which would mean like fundamentally changing the everything API the way, yeah. infrastructure such that it works differently you know, and breaks everything. That's not going to happen. Instead, we've, we've, we've um, architected this in such a way that individual pieces of functionality can evolve over time right. without having to destroy the, yeah. the underlying. But there is a plan, uh, or at least thought process in, in mind for some people saying, what is the core set of things in the mm -hmm. Kubernetes core API um, that are not in GA, that we need to get to GA before we can say, hey, maybe we can do a LTS version now, okay. right? So. And that is an even longer discussion. Right. Uh, doing a LTS or a V2 is a longer discussion. But the idea is we are trying to push APIs to go GA so that then we can do an LTS or somebody can do an LTS, even if we don't do an LTS. Yeah, right? I think there's, yes. And I think there's also another thought process or, or these are all just sort of vague ideas people have, but you know, there's a part of Kubernetes that is sort of container orchestration, mm -hmm. but there's the piece of Kubernetes that is the API machinery, which has been, is being used for many, many other things than container orchestration. And so, you know, if you, you know, it, you can kind of parcel out potentially that, that gem into a more, a smaller core of Kubernetes, you know, and, and then the, the, the other functionality is not necessarily all necessary, like namespaces are necessary, users are necessary. You know, yeah. there's a bunch of things that are necessary. I'll give you one more example. Like queue proxy is something that people are aware of, right? But there are vendors that don't ship queue proxy because they do it differently. Yeah. So they don't need queue proxy. Uh, Cilium, for example, right? Uh, so, and there is projects like Virtual Kubelet. They say, hey, this Kubelet thing, if we uh, replace it with Virtual Kubelet, maybe we'll do another set of use case and scenarios, right? Um, there is a version of Kubelet uh, uh, that is written in Rust that supports Wasm. So that's another use case. So there are a lot of things happening in the community uh, where people are trying different things out. And we are watching, listening, learning from what they are trying to do. And at, at some point, we'll evolve things over a period of time. We just want to do it in a fashion where we are not going to break you. And uh, you know there is guarantees around um, stability, uh, version skew, and things like that, which yeah. we have baked in, so that we are doing trying to do the right thing for you, so it's easier on you. 
Thank you for the question. Any others? Yes. How much time does it take you to take this role of your work life? 100%. Sorry? How much do you put yourself into this um, architecture team <laughs> role? Is it okay. 100%? Personally, <laughs> personal question or, okay. <laughs> I, I think it varies for each. So we're, we're co-chairs and we have one other co-chair, um, Derek Carr. And uh, so, um, you know, I, I think it varies. Like, yeah, it's not just the two of us. <laughs> right. There's a whole team. That, we're just the chairs, right? There's, yeah. There's all these sub projects have other team members, people working on it. So, but and it, and it varies during the time of year. So I, I am one of the people that does, does production readiness reviews, and there's only two or three other people that do that for the whole project. So that means in the two three weeks before enhancements freeze, I'm spending a lot of time. You he know, gets review, review, like, review, 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 review. John, but please this one. Please there are that other one. time periods where it's like I, I, I only spend, you know. A few hours that week, you know, it really it, it, it yeah, it varies uh, depending on the calendar time. Same for me, like core organization, we try to do whatever we can early in the cycle, uh, like before uh, V1, uh, no, uh, Alpha One or something like that. We have milestones, so we try to put as many of the changes so that it bakes in the CI systems. So over a period of time, we'll watch and say, hey, um, you know, something is wrong, right? Like. So you start making changes early, and the more invasive the change, the earlier you do it. Um, for example, we are changing K log, right? So we try to do it right early in the cycle. So later in the cycle, people are like, okay, it's smoothened out over time, and nothing is bothering the CI systems, and uh, users will be able to use it fine. Okay? Okay, I think we're out of time, but uh, thank you all. And, thank you. Uh,